All right, good afternoon. I think we're gonna probably have a few people trickling in, so hopefully uh, we'll have room. Um, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Mr. Carl Gidley. He is a senior data scientist here at MPH. Uh, he received his undergrad in economics and Spanish. He has a master's of divinity and will be uh, shortly pursuing a master's of public administration at Harvard University. Um, he's come through MPH with a previous background in healthcare technology and has worked for the state for about the last two and a half years. Um, personally, I've gotten a chance to work with Carl on multiple projects. Um, his enthusiasm, his uh, insightfulness, and his drive uh, really sets him apart in our data science community here in the state. Uh, appreciate uh, all of his work that he's done on this and many other projects. Um, some of the um, most impactful stuff he's worked on is, has to do with post-secondary credentials, as well as workforce um, space, analyzing and career different pathways and impacts. Um, I'll let Carl take the presentation away. If you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to him after. All right. Thank you, Brian. Check, check. You guys hear me in the back? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. So yeah, like Brian mentioned, my name is Carl Gidley, and today we'll be talking about digestible data visualizations. Now, I'll confess up front, this the presentation is a bit of a commercial uh, for these two Udemy classes. So if you're interested, we talk about today and want to learn more, I would recommend both of these. Um, the first one, uh, Mastering Data Visualization Theory and Foundations, is all at the, kind of more at the conceptual level, so there's no, no coding. Uh, required for that one, but has a, a lot of interesting content on data viz and, and how, to, how to do that in, in a, an effective way. Um, but and then the second one at the bottom is it, you know, specifically focused on ggplot2, which is a, a code package, a code library in R that you can use to actually produce uh, the visualization. So all the, in kind of the third section, we'll, we'll look at some sample charts and those are all made in, in ggplot2. But I, I'll have this uh, same slide at the end too, so if you wanna take a picture or something later, um, it, will be, it will return. Um, so yeah, so before we get started, let's, let's kind of think really broadly about data visualization. So you know, what is a data visualization? And at, at a really simple level, it's a, you know, it's a visual summary of many, many rows of data. It could be a few thousand, could be a few million, a few billion rows. Um, so you, know, you could see here, if we look at this uh, sales data for, for various office supplies, it, it would take you a long time. It would take me a long time to, to decide which one had the, had the highest sales if we just had this, uh, this data set in a spreadsheet. But if we, if we turn that into a bar chart, as you've seen, you know, we can tell which one had the highest sales, for, for example, very quickly. Um, so that's what a data, you know, data visualization is a, vi a visual summary, but why do we make them? You know, you can't wear a data visualization, you can't eat them, they make terrible gifts. But I think, you know, there's, there's probably a dozen good reasons why I make data visual visualizations, but at least in the public sector, I think we like to make, we make data visualizations so we can move the needle on some uh, you know, issue of social concern that we care about. Something's happening in the world around us. You know, and so we wanna analyze the data to make a difference with our work. Um, but I think often, in my experience, maybe yours too, you know, data visualization and, and some kind of social issue of concern that we care about, maybe third, third grade reading literacy test scores in this case, can feel like there's a huge, huge canyon between the work we do, you know, the bar charts, the, the line graphs, pie charts maybe, um, and actually, you know, influencing the world around us for good. And so I think to start, to think a, a little bit, continue thinking a bit more broadly and, and think a bit about what happens kind of in this canyon, you know, what's, what's kind of the mechanics to go from a data visualization, a bar chart, a line graph to actual, you know, real world impact. I like to think of this kind of the, the anatomy, so to speak, of moving the needle with a data visualization. So to start, we have our three kind of core pieces in the story. So you, have, you know, you have your chart, your bar graph, have, have stakeholders here. So in this case, we will think about school administrators. So kind of coming, coming to this from the perspective of, a, of an analyst, uh, helping uh, stakeholders in the public education system. And then, you know, this social metric, a way we measure kind of the health of, the health of our society, in this case, again, third grade reading test scores. Um, and so, you know, at, at a high level, I think, you know, school administrators or whoever's kind of in that decision-making capacity, uh, have, they have mental models, you know, for kind of how the world works in their space. Um, so, you know, some might emphasize if they want to increase third grade literacy, some might emphasize um, hiring additional staff to help at school. So hiring additional school, school aides 
while others maybe w would emphasize um, you know, the work that happens at home, reading to your kids, maybe equipping parents on how to, how to help their kids learn to read. So these, I think these mental models, you know, if we, we, we all um, encounter just endless complexity and detail in our daily lives, and so we all kind of produce these simplified stories about how the, about how the world works, and then we use those stories to, to act. You know, the, what we believe about how, how the world works, kind of the social systems where we, we inhabit, influences how we act. So again, you know, if, 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 if an administrator's mental model uh, places emphasis on hiring teachers, a, teacher aides, you know, maybe that, that's the strategy they'll pursue in their budgeting and hiring. Um, whereas if someone puts a greater emphasis on at home, you know, learning to read at home, they might offer a workshop um, for parents on how to help their kids read or something like that. Okay, so this is, I think, where the, the data visualization comes in. I think an effective data visualization help, kind of helps to refine these mental models. So you know, as we, we all encounter this endless complexity of our daily lives, we, we develop kind of these pixelated, simplified stories of the world around us. And if, and if data, data visualizations are done right, I can kind of like refine those stories or maybe think about it like a camera coming slightly more into focus. You know, there's always, there's always more complexity, there's more, more to learn. Um, but yeah, I think data viz done well can help us to see the world a little bit more clearly um, and then act, you know, refine that mental model and then act in alignment with how the world, with how the world works. And then, you know, if we do that, we'd see improvements, hopefully, in, in our communities and in the, in the world we live in. Okay, so for example, let's say a study is released that shows that schools that, that have more teacher's aides do have higher, higher reading scores. You know, maybe we look over time school hires additional uh, aides in the classroom and they see their lit literary sc literacy scores go up. Um, so, you know, that, that study, that release, probably contains some bar charts, line graphs that tell a story about the research done in that area, refines that mental, mental models, you know, kind of affirms the emphasis placed on in-classroom learning and then could lead to additional hiring in that space. Um, but yeah, so what, what kinds of uh, data visualizations effectively refine mental, mental models. And apologize, maybe a little bit sl small at the bottom here, but the, I think the three kind of large categories that come to mind for me at least are that they're accurate. You know, they, they calculate things correctly. They have an accurate understanding of, of what the data is, what it kind of represents in the real world. They're relevant, you know, so obviously a, a data viz on uh, hospitalization rates or something like that won't won't help third grade reading scores, but has to be kind of subject domain uh, relevant. And then our topic for today is they have to be digestible. Um, and so I think we'll get into this a bit later too, but I think kind of five sub bullets under that is that they're uh, the digestible visualizations have smart chart choices. They use clear labels. Um, there's, they make clear comparisons. They use an efficient use of ink, kind of our digital ink that we we use when we um, use software to make visualizations. And they, they also use a purposeful use of color. So we'll, we'll get into the, some more details about that in, in a bit, but first I think it's helpful to ask, you know, why, why do data visualizations need to be digestible? Um, and so let's, let's pretend that we're all data analysts and this is a, a calendar of one of our stakeholders. So we've got a big data visualization presentation coming up. Can you find it? A little bit like where's Waldo on Thursday afternoon. So I think just wanted to make the point, you know, our, our stakeholders as analysts were seeking to help refine our, our, our stakeholders' mental models. They have a lot going on. We all have a lot going on on our schedule. So, you know, they just came from a meeting. Maybe they're going into a meeting after that data visualization presentation. I think the same thing kind of applies in an asynchronous uh, delivery as well. You know, if we make a dashboard that someone's checking on their own time, we're kind of fitting that in um, in the midst of other things. And you know, we also have our, our, our kid has an assignment at school that's on our mind, um, and we're trying to remember maybe like what time the haircut was that we had scheduled. So we're going out for, for dinner for a friend's birthday later, um, and you know, there's that huge stack of dishes that's on our mind and. We might, you know, stakeholders might still be a bit frustrated with sitting in traffic like this on the way to work. So I think all that to say, you know, none of us are at, at full energy when we come to meetings, when we come to these discussions. We, you know, we, we have a lot going on and we can't all be 
like the brain from, from Pinky and Brain with kind of flexing his full battery there. So um, yeah, it's really important to make, to make data visualizations that, that don't require you know, more time, more energy, kind of more cognitive capacity than our stakeholders have to give. Um, so I think you know, one way to think about, maybe another way to fr frame digestible data, data visualizations is, is that they're cognitively concise. They just, they just don't, they, you know, they make the point quickly um, and yeah, don't require too much uh, discussion to just understand what, it, what it's saying. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully convince you it's important that our data visualizations are digestible. Um, so let's get a bit into the weeds. Um, just these five, these five uh, characteristics of digestible d visualizations. I'm sure there, there are many others on that list. I would be curious to hear uh, if anyone has one that I'm missing here too at the, at the end. But yeah, let's dig into this. And the, um, to give a bit of, uh, I guess quickly to give a bit of, of background on the data set I'm using, it's, there's this uh, kind of toy data set that comes preloaded in R that tracks uh, the weight growth of baby chickens over 21 time periods. Um, so the data set, there's 45 baby chickens. There's, they're on four different diets and there's 21 time periods. So if we looked at just chick one's weight over time, uh, you know, the, the line graph might look something like this. So this is the data set I'm using for, for all the example visualizations going forward. Okay, so the first one is smart chart choices and we're gonna start with a pop quiz. So I didn't realize there's no grade, but, but uh, yeah, please play along. So if you look at this pie chart, how many times bigger is the number of chicks in this 100 to 199 gram, gram category in the blue than the 300 and above group in the yellow? Kind of take a look at that. Maybe jot down you know, the number of times larger you think that is. Make a note on your phone. Just stick it in your brain somewhere. Dramatic pause for people to think. Okay, all right, so store that number away. We'll ask the same question but using a bar chart this time. So yeah, how many times bigger is that blue bar than the yellow bar? Store that number as well. Maybe it's the same, maybe it's different. I don't know if that one was easier or harder. But the, the drum roll, the answer is that it's five times bigger. So there's four chicks in the 300 and above and uh, 20 in the 100 to 199 grams. So I think it's, inter it's interesting to think about how some, some chart types um, just inherently are easier for the human, human brain, the human mind to perceive and, and evaluate than other chart types. Um, so a, a few uh, researchers, William Cleveland and Robert McGill, did a, wrote a paper in 1984 um, that is still very, very relevant today and called Graphical Perception Theory, Experimentation, Application, and the Development of Graf Graf Graphical Methods. So what, what basically what they did is they identified these 10 kind of what they called perceptual tasks. So you know, as a human being uh, seeks, seeks to decode, understand a, a chart or a graph, these are kind of the, the 10 things we can do. You know, we can um, compare th position of two things on a common scale or a, a non-aligned scale, can, can look at the, compare the length of two, two items on the chart, direction, angle, area, volume, curvature, shading, and then color saturation. So they, and they, they studied this. So they gave uh, individuals, uh, you know, just like the pop quiz we just had, they gave uh, individuals a lot of uh, questions like that and then, and then measured to see how accurate they were estimate, estimating those, those various quantities. And what they found uh, is that they kind of, they did that and then they ranked those 10 based on how, how accurate people were. So, and then use that to infer, these are you know, the tasks that people perform more accurately or the easier tasks to do. So the, they found at least that the easiest task was to um, compare two things position and common scale. Um, then in second place was comparing objects in non-aligned scales. Um, Third would be a, th th a three-way tie between length, direction, and angle. Fourth, area. Fifth, curvature and volume. And then sixth was uh, determining shading and color, color saturation. Um, 
So if you're like me, if I, you know, if I'm doing doing the pop quiz, what I what I first want to do is is you know compare the length for the bar chart, or the, and then the area for the pie chart. I don't know if you know. Maybe others have that same process, so it's possible that you know that if you found the bar chart easier to interpret, um, that could be why. It's maybe an easier task that the bar chart asks you to do. It's actually, just quickly a show of hands. Did anybody find the bar chart easier than the pie chart? Okay. A lot of folks. Anybody find the pie chart easier? All right. Yeah. It's not an exact thing. Anybody felt like they were just kind of you know, indistinguishable, about the same? All right. Yeah, so I think another way, maybe partially what, what could explain that is another way to in interpret the pie chart is to, to actually compare the angles that those segments have and not, not the full area of the piece of pie, which is you know, tied for third based on their study. Um, it is just one study, so I don't know. You know, you can take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I think another thing, you know, had I given the, the actual numbers on that y-axis, like the bar, bar chart maybe would have been even easier. You know, where all you have to do is kind of compare the tops of each bar and where they fall in that, that position of common scale. So this isn't to say, I, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not in the camp of we should never use pie charts. I know some people feel very strongly or not strongly about that. I think sometimes there's, you know, use to like the pie chart inherently communicates parts of a whole in a unique way. But, but I, I do think there's something to be said here, where you know, as we're making, you know, imagine a, maybe a report or a longer narrative that contains 20, 30 different visualizations. I think there's, it's helpful to make that digestible by thinking about incorporating more, more charts that are easy, you know, just easy on, on our, men, our minds to interpret and decode the values. Um, so yeah, we don't have to all just make bar charts all the time, but, but maybe more, bar, you know, lean towards bar charts is kind of the message. So next. This is a simple one, it's just having clear labels. So this is, you know, if we visualize uh, the, the weights of, of the, the various baby chickens by time period. So these are, uh, it's like a ridge plot. So these are distributions of, of, of the chickens by weight on the x-axis um, and then time period on the y-axis. And so if I produce this chart in, in R using ggplot2, this is the, the default chart. Um, and I've seen a lot of charts, you know, at various conferences that just look exactly like this. And, and presenters do a lot, a lot of what I just did, which is kind of explaining verbally what, what could just be in, labeled on the chart. Um, so yeah, the very, second point two is very simple, but just using, taking that extra time to use, to add clear labels, you know, saying, this is, you know, this is the chick weight, the baby chicken weight, not just weight, and it's in grams, you know, so we don't have to wonder what the units are. Um, and saying time period instead of this kind of awkward, like, you know, it's a, the time in the data set is a factor variable in R. Like, we don't need to include that in the label. We can just say this is time period and then adding a descriptive title on the top. Okay. So thirdly, another thing we can do to make our uh, data visualizations more digestible is to is to create really clear comparisons in the chart itself. So let's just say, I don't, I'm, I'm not an expert on on the the growth of baby chickens, but let's just say, for for example, that the ideal weight for baby chickens at time period 20, whatever that means, um, is somewhere in this 175 to 250 grams. So let's say we wanted to ask the question, you know, which diet, you know, best produces chickens, best help helps baby chickens get to that ideal weight at the right time. So we might look at, you know, this is, so this is diet one in the orange here, and you could look at that and say, oh, that seems pretty good. Diet two, maybe a little bit less. Diet three seems like maybe less. Hard to say which one, you know, might be, might be more. Diet four seems to have a lot, but is that, seems like more than diet two, diet one. You kind of get the idea, like it's, like our, I think it's hard for our brain to store, it's hard for our brain to store different visuals and compare them inside of our minds. So one thing um, we can do is just bake that comparison directly into the chart. And so you can just see all at the same time, you know, all four distributions by, by diet and make that, make that comparison and just you know, really quickly see that diet four produces the most baby chickens in that ideal weight range um, at time period 20. It's a lot of, so yeah, a lot of, can be helpful to minimize kind of that flipping back and forth and having to remember uh, kind of different versions of the same chart instead of give users uh, a, the ability to, to see that directly in, in the chart that's made. 
Right, next, we have efficient, efficient use of ink. So, you know, we, we, most of the charts we have today are, you know, we make today are gonna be produced digitally. It doesn't, there's not like a, a, a financial cost to using more or less ink for the charts you, you make, uh, you know, in Tableau or R or Python, Power BI. Um, but there is, you know, kind of on, on, on our, in our conversation, there's a, a, a cognitive cost to all the ink on a chart. So this is, again, this is the kind of the default chart that, uh, that ggplot will produce um, with these clear comparisons in mind. But there's some extra, you know, there's some extra gray underneath the, the x-axis there and to the, to the left of the, the y-axis. And so can clean it up, up a little bit and just get rid of that. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, like anything that's on the page, our mind, you know, will process any ink that's on the page. So the more we can clean up the visual, the, more, the, the less energy is required of our stakeholders. And again, kind of the less, the more likely it, it is that the chart will be, you know, easily understood and will kind of make, have its message land. Or maybe even, if nothing else, just to, 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 to produce productive conversation around the issue that we're talking about. So, so yeah, we can get rid of that space. I think another thing that we can trim away is this dark background at all. You know, you can lighten up the background to give less, less for our minds to, to process. Um, and then as well here, there's this alpha legend here. Alpha is like the, the parameter for how transparent the distributions are in R, but you know, we can see that, you know, like we don't need to know that the alpha is set at 0.5. So we can get rid of that and then the, um, you know, this title on the color chart too. Like each, each color is labeled with diet one, diet two, diet three. We don't necessarily need that, that word diet there. So we can get rid, of, get rid of that as well. So, you know, small, small tweaks, but I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the chart on, the, on the, your left, I think is, is easier to process than the, the, or the chart on your right, excuse me. It's easier to process than the, the chart on the left. You can kind of you cover an eye and see you know, which one takes, takes more time, more energy to, to make sense of. Okay, and then finally, the last, the last characteristic of a digestible data visualization is, is a purposeful use of co color. I thought this, there's this, this article from Medium called uh, The Psychology Behind Data Visualization Techniques. They talk a bit about the, the paper discussed earlier, but they also draw some principles from like gestalt theory, which I'm not, again, not, not an expert in. I think it's a kind of a field of psychology. And, and one thing that what they, they uh, um, pointed out that, that you know, we, when we look at a visualization, the thing that visually most uh, sticks out to us is likely the thing we're gonna focus on. Like we'll see first and also continue to kind of focus on as we look at that visualization. So I think color is one way in a sense, you can almost choose, you can use color purposely to choose what your audience will, will look at first and therefore kind of focus on in the visualization. Um, so if we go back to our, you know, our, our distribution chart, if, if, we want, if what we wanna highlight is you know, which diet produced the most baby chickens in that ideal weight range, let's just color that, you know, add color to that, that distribution and put all the other diets in grayscale. So you can kind of see how at least for me, if I look at the, the chart on your left, you know, my brain wants to kind of make sense of the different colors and is taking that in. But on the right, like it's hard to think about anything other, other than these blue ridges. It's like immediately pops out. Okay, and then there's actually, I've got a couple bonus. So one bonus one, I think is to use, um, like kind of after you're finished with the visualization. But one technique that I've, I've found that I like to use is to, to create a both kind of a super title and a subtitle where the, the subtitle is kind of a more descriptive, here's what this thing is we're looking at. We're looking at you know, weight distribution of chicks by diet over time, but then can use that super title to really just to explicitly say what the point of the chart is. You know, diet four produces the most baby chickens in this ideal optimal weight range of 175 to 250. So I hope you, know, that's, you can kind of see where we started, at least at the, from the point of making those clear comparisons um, to the end here. Removing the ink, um, you know, using purposeful use of color, kind of the final product, and hopefully that's a, a cognitively concise, you know, digestible data visualization and 
you know, minor tweaks, but if you think about you know, the amount of time that's, that's required to read maybe a 50-page report that has 25 visuals in it or something like that, you know, over, over time, this, this could um, you know, cut down a, a lot of energy required uh, by, by uh, the audience of a particular report. And, and also, um, I think in a, in a meeting too, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to, can help avoid you know, taking the first 10 minutes of a half hour meeting to understand what a chart's saying. You can just understand things more quickly and jump right into conversation around that chart. Or maybe even, you know, given what the chart says, what should we do you know, in this, this area of, of policy? Um, okay, I think that's, yeah, so that's, that's you know, again, just why that's important. You can see that, that flow of, of refining mental models uh, using data visualizations to you know, actions that are more aligned with the world we live in. Um, and obviously accuracy and relevancy are very important aspects of a, a, visual, of a visualization, but today I'm just focusing on this digestibility, um, producing cognitively concise charts. Okay, so I think I'll just put this back up if people wanted to grab those, uh, um, those classes. I'm happy to, I think we've got, I went fast, it was like a half hour, so if you, Happy to, to do some q and I'm sure there are other things too that I, I didn't mention, but so happy to if the if folks in the audience wanna throw out some um, you know, things they found help, helpful in, in producing kind of efficient, uh, cognitively concise presentations. But yeah, we can do a little Q&A and discussion. Um, we've, got, we've got some time. We've got like 20 minutes or so, but we don't have to use it all. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I can bring the mic to you if you want to ask your question. Uh, Carl, I did want to point out to the audience, um, we finally received our data proficiency badges. Ooh. So uh, if you want to stop by the MPH booth, you can get those. Um, they look like this, little magnet badges for the gold, or the green, gold, and the blue badges. And since Carl is leaving us, Carl tested out of our program, to be honest. <laughs> no, I didn't uh, test. Took he the was test. super smart. <laughs> but here are your badges, Carl. Thank, Thank you. you Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for, for all of your hard work with the state. We, uh, I'm a 19 and a half year state employee, so uh, Carl's one of the smartest ones that I've met. And that is not saying anything bad about us as state employees. But Carl is so smart, I've understood maybe half the conversations that I've had with him. So <laughs> who's got a question for Carl? Anybody? Any plants? Brian? Oh, we got one. I'll bring the mic to you, sir. So not really a question, but more a added comment for everyone. Yeah. I'm a basically a daily R user, so I, I use ggplot all the time. Yeah. Um, if anyone's nervous about trying to use R or ggplot in particular, there is so there are so many resources out there. Stack Exchange can be your best friend. Um, there's there's endless like community and user support for R. So don't be nervous to give it a try. It is so feature rich that not using it could be a misstep. Yeah, I think that's so true. And there's you know I think. Spend so much time just Googling, you know, ggplot2, how to make the bar go down or whatever. You know, there's like so much, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, that. how can I remove the legend or right. how can I set the colors manually or anything like that? There's, there's endless resources out there, so don't be afraid to try it. This, I'll, I'll say too, kind of on that note, this, this class comes with a nice PDF, the ggplot2 one comes with a nice PDF where she kind of shows, um, Kind of like the anatomy of a ggplot chart with with number labels and says, okay, this is what this is called. You know, some some of the names are very intuitive, others aren't, and so I found that PDF is like very helpful to use too. But I don't get paid for this if people take this class. It's not <laughs> just found it just found it helpful. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts, comments, or questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, I work a lot with data visualizations, and I know that some programs have some limitations. Um, what are your best programs that you use, whether they're prescrip uh, prescri <laughs> subscriptions or free, or just what are some of the ones that you like to use the most? Yeah, it's a good question. So in, in, in my mind, I, I think there's kind of maybe two buckets, right? There's like more interactive visualizations, um, like a Tableau or Power BI where the end user can filter and 
you know, change what, what the visualization is. And then there's the more like kind of static, like what I showed today is I, at least in my mind is kind of more of a static visualization in like a report or like a data story. Um, so I think it depends a little bit what, what you're wanting to do. I, I, I personally do like R because you can like, it, it opens up that um, ability to automate, like in, in, instead of like clicking a lot in, in an in a application, you can, you can write lines of code and then, and honestly like often repurpose those. So if you, you have a new project, um, you can, you know, run the same functions or same lines of code to produce a similar chart. Um, we actually, at, at MPH, we have a, a function that in our, that um, kind of bakes in our branding for the various charts. So, it, you know, we, you can easily access the, I'm not a designer, but like the hex codes that come with, with various colors, you know, to make sure we're following our brand guidelines or, or like the font that we're using. So I find things like that helpful. Um, what, what, and I guess maybe the one other thing I'll say is we've we've experimented a, a bit with um, creating reports using R Markdown documents. So that it's a document type in in R Studio that allows you to embed code and then mark down text, so you can produce like a, a report that has both charts, but embedded inside of like just paragraphs of text where you're explaining what you're saying or maybe citing different sources and things like that, and then. Um, Th those can be published to like an HTML file and hosted on a server. So I think kind of the dream, like if I think about, um, you know, public like data visualization kind of informing um, strategic decision making in the public sector, I think the dream is kind of a server that hosts a lot of those documents, which you can add interactive elements to similar to a Power BI or Tableau. And then you can share it, like share it with a stakeholder using a hyperlink. So, you know, maybe if you work for the Department of Education or something like that, you could have, um, folks could have a, a folder in, in, in their browser that just has all the links to the various reports and something like that to kind of per, have a modern delivery system of information. But started to ramble there a little bit, but yeah, that's kind of what comes to mind for me. Yeah. I'll hit, I'll hit her first and then you. Hi, I had a question. Um, what are some of the most effective visual representations for certain types of data? So actually you mentioned the Department of Education and I do work for them. Great. What's, yeah. a, what's a good way that you could present something where it would really stand out to a stakeholder? Or what's something that you've seen? Yeah, yeah, I think it, I do think it's, it depends somewhat on you know, what, what the topic is and what you're trying to say, which I honestly think that's kind of, <coughs> where kind of the art of data visual, uh, visualization comes in, where there's, you might have to go through s several iterations, right, to kind of get that final chart that really kind of pops and cap captures what you're saying. But I mean, a lot of it is simple, like bar charts, line charts, think of heat maps. Heat maps can be helpful. Um, one, one thing that I've done a little bit in the, um, like tracking wage growth, like for post-secondary programs, is you can, you can, with ggplot, you can plot multiple layers of graphs on top of each other. So you could have, have like a histogram distribution of wage earners and then kind of on top of that, put another distribution or even just a vertical kind of bar to show like here's the median wage before getting a bachelor's degree and here's a median wage after or some things like that. Like the, I think like ggplot2 is pretty flexible in that way where you can, can add layers to get, really produce pretty, um, like very custom charts in an automated way. Hey, uh, mine's more of a suggestion statement. So I work for IDEM and as one of the few more expert side users of R, um, and being around people who have at least dabbled in R, we actually started a group at our agency that's the, like the R user network so we can share information and um, get people up to speed on what kinds of, you know, automating tasks they can do with their data. So I would um, suggest other agencies try and form those kind of groups because um, it's been really helpful for us. Yeah, it's great to Google. It's also great to have a, someone you sit next to that can like just tell you what to do or, or you know send you a, a code snippet too. That's awesome. Got another question over here, Carl. Any advice specifically for creating digestible data dashboarding, or, or are we really just extrapolating these individual skills for each chart that we're putting on there? Yeah, that's a good that's a good thought. I 
I do, I do think they are a little bit of a different animal. I think some of this applies, you know, like maybe getting rid of some of the extra legends and things like that, like that efficient use, use of ink really comes to mind. Um, so yeah, and maybe the one thing I'll say, I'd be curious, maybe other folks, I, I, I don't spend as much time on interactive visualizations right now, so I don't, it's not as fresh in my mind. Um, I, I did some more of that work um, when I was working in healthcare technology. And the one thing that sticks with me from that is like trying to create like a like follow the way we read something, you know. So you like if there's like a flow in the dashboard to like people kind of move left to right, and at least in the in English, right, move left to right and top to bottom, and you can even you know create. I forget what it's called in Tableau, like a cell or um, I forget what it's called, but like a you know maybe a block that has like a a bit of text that say, hey, click here to do this, and you can kind of guide the user through the through the dashboard like in a really explicit way, but. I don't know. Yeah, I'd be curious if, it, if anybody else has other thoughts on that. Pains. Pains. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'll come back to you, Brian. Okay. <laughs> so, a question around once you have the visualizations refined and where you want them, do you have any resources, recommendations uh, around building the narrative? around uh, to speak to those visualizations yeah yeah I think um, I don't know if I have anything like super insightful to say I think it just iterate is kind of what what I've found it's like you know create a draft write it out I think that's um, this, isn't, this isn't really this is not really answering your question it's not a resource but like I think I, f I find that the if I think about the process I've taken, I think what's kind of worked on our team is like just to write a draft kind of forces you to clarify your thinking by putting it into words and then show it to someone on your team, you know. And Would you find yourself building it from the visualization or do you try to write a narrative first and, and work uh, a visualization to really match yeah. what that, that yeah, what you have question. in your head? I think, um, I think I tend to go visualization to narrative and maybe maybe a first step too is like kind of like a like an academic context like a liter literature review right like if you're doing a data viz on third grade re reading scores if you're writing a report it's helpful to see like what other people have done you know like what's what research has been done what other reports are out there for, for like for Indiana or like you know other states or national even and I think sometimes those can be helpful to kind of orient orient your work to, by getting a sense of where the conversation is currently at and then you can see like what contribution, where, where, where your contribution can be. Thank you. I also find that like the process of coming up with what that descriptive title you had. Yeah. Helps you think through like what is the main point that I'm trying to make with this. And that right. sort of helps me to then think like how do I want to talk about it in the right. report as a whole. Right. Sort of like back and forth. Right. Cool. It's just hard, it's hard to do, right? It's like hard, sometimes you're like, okay, what am I... I'm really interested in this data, and I've made a lot of charts, but what am I saying, you know? It's like, I don't know, <laughs> so think about that. Yeah, I was gonna add real quick on that. I think one of the things we've found successful on our data science team is we just share a lot, a lot of kind of back and forth. I try to always tell them to avoid the choose your own adventure dashboards, where you get in and it's like the customer just starts clicking on a whole series of random filters until the filters of the filters of the filters and like, you know, it's it's important that you kind of have the beginning and the middle and the end of things. And I think we've been pushing a lot more for the data story space where you can really put a lot of your deeper analysis and deeper uh, thoughts into it. Um, and then the, the big thing is, um, I think one thing that we get out from having the group sessions is um, we avoid the misconstruing of data. So by getting other people's feedback and somebody looks at it completely different than you, and the worst thing that can happen is somebody completely misunderstands what you're trying to say and thinks the exact opposite. So I think we, we really try to eliminate a lot of that stuff through, uh, we have an internal kind of data review process, we have teaming that kind of looks at different things. Um, so we have quite a bit of eyes that go into um, these types of projects with the data stories. And I feel like that's been a successful kind of link here to help with the data viz side. Any other questions? I can travel all the way to the back if needed. Oh. Got one more. It's not really a question. I was just going to follow up on what he said about, um, 
you know, if you have several different eyes on it, but I think when you're getting close to a finished product, if you can get it in front of someone who hasn't been a part of any of it along the way, completely fresh eyes and what's your immediate, you know, take away from this graph, are they getting what, what you're wanting them to get from it? Right. Are they understanding it? That kind of thing? That's, yeah, that's, a, yes. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I, yes, actually, no. I went, um, <laughs> kind of quick, quickly on that note, I had a chance to go to a couple, um, uh, it's called APAM, it's like the Association for Public Policy and Management, I think is the name of the organization. They do like a research conference, it's mostly, mostly academic researchers presenting kind of papers and prog progress to their colleagues and getting feedback. But one, one thing they, they do in some of the sessions is, is that they'll have the person present, or they'll maybe, they'll, maybe it's an hour and a half session, they'll have three or four people present, and then they'll assign someone beforehand to read all the papers beforehand and also present the kind of their reactions. And I thought that was like a, a I just, we have, you know, I've had that in the back of my mind as a, a potential model to kind of bring into this work as well, where you have someone kind of give like a really thoughtful, kind of prepared remarks to kind of start, like jumpstart the conversation. But yeah, I, I think that's great. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, do you have like a data viz pet peeve? Like you see someone else's graph and you're like, ooh, you know, makes you cringe a little bit? Um, I don't know. I think I think when they're when they're like very busy, I guess, which is kind of the it's maybe just the main thing I said is like paring things down. But it's when it's hard to like I don't know. When you just have a lot of extra stuff on a chart. I, I might have to think about that more. That's what comes to mind at first is just like the a lot of distraction. You know, it's like it, I just find that it's really it's a way to. Um, Kind of serve stakeholders and our teammates well by like doing that work beforehand to really like clarify what it is you want to say, like what point of view you want to bring to the conversation. Um, but I guess uh, now that I said that sometimes it's fine too to be like I'm kind of a mess and like I've I know, my mind is wrapped up in knots on this project. And I need someone to help me to figure out like what I've done and where I need to go next. I think that's great too. But no, no juicy pet peeve in that answer. But. <laughs> All right, any other questions? We've got about four more minutes. All right, well, seeing none, Carl, I'll let you have the last word. Great, thank you. Thanks for the discussion and for coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs>